Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortnaster, and welcome back to another Laser Pig reaction. And yeah, this video doesn't ha isn't ominous at all. How to kill a god? Yeah, so um, I have a feeling I know what this is about, given that I think the thumbnail had Putin in it. So I believe that's the quote-unquote god uh, that's going to be the topic of discussion today. And yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at the little bit of a description. I mean, it's this is talking about the the interview that Tucker Carlson did with Putin. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, granted, and, you know, a couple of months has happened, so stuff might have, you know, come to the surface since then, talking more about that. Um, I didn't actually watch the um, the interview. I just saw all the memes that came up afterwards. Like, the, like, I, like I do know that... Putin kind of waxed on poetically about like the history of Russia when like Tucker Carlson asked why you invade and he talked about it's like oh back in like 1455 you know that sort of stuff so I mean I know there, there was a fair number of jokes and memes made about that just because of you know the absurdity uh, but yeah other than that I I don't know that much about what happened in the interview, so this is definitely going to be a learning experience for me because I'd much rather watch Laserbig talk about the interview than actually watch the interview itself because I just... Because one, I, uh, cause I'd either get really bored watching it or get really angry. Or a combination of the two and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, this video is almost an hour and a half long, so you know that this means this reaction is going to be cut in half. So, of course, the link to the second half will be in the description as well as, you know, in the top right corner of the video, as well as, you know, link to my Let's Play of the Day. And, yeah, with all that out of the way, I guess we should finally get this thing started then, shall we? Palace Look, of I'm Righteous gonna be honest Judgment. With you. I don't want to be known as the politics pig, so I gotta keep reminding you people, you wanted this. I want to make myself a pillow fort and eat Maltesers today, but everyone insists I gotta cover the <laughs> so I guess I'm a political YouTuber now. Let me just don my wrist. Okay, so I mean, Laser Pig, if you ever somehow see this video, I just, I very much would just love for you to have a shirt with your, like, your, um, with your avatar on it with political pig, uh, just above it. That would be, that'd be just perfect. I'd love that. Perspective color hat and upload my next video essay on why all the suggestive and highly interpretive symbology in Fight Club represents my specific ideology. In fact, <laughs> yeah. I have an idea. Oh no, what's happening? There. Now I can fold my arms every time I think you've made a good point. Like all the cool kids. <laughs> So I went over all of this on a live stream already, and I don't want to retread the same ground, but for the people who don't watch the live stream that I do with the NAFA boys over on Digi's channel, I'll quickly sort of break it down for everyone. This was a car crash of an interview. A truly from remarkable what I heard, yeah. sight to behold. I was speechless at times because, well, okay, you know what? This is going to sound a little weird to people not used to modern politics, but almost the entirety of politics is a performance. It's a dance coated in ritualistic nonsense aimed at whatever wavelength of politics you operate on. Fascism, fascism does it better. It always has, because to a point, liberalism is all about understanding the needs of the individual, which can change every couple of miles, hence why it always comes over as a little bit wishy-washy. I mean, you don't care what's going on two towns over. No one around here does. They're weird over there. <laughs> but to a politician who may represent multiple towns in a district, they kind of have to. Whereas fascism doesn't care about the individual. I mean, it pretends to, and it pretends to care about the needs of the state, but it simply boils the needs of the state and the individual down to its most basic components. God, country, family. I kind of want to go into and then more even, detail, but that's an... Well, I mean, even then, I mean, like, I know, like, the Nazis, I mean, they, they were actually trying to get rid of the God portion of that near the end there. Venture for a different day. So the essentials of fascism are to convince you, the voting majority, that any or all of those are somehow under threat from whatever voting minority is the enemy today. Now, technically, that's impossible, because what you consider to be, taking one of these for example, your family values are going to differ from family to family. The, family, Maybe the yeah. values of your family are just to eat dinner together around the table every day and talk like a family. 
well, gays, immigrants, drag queens in Europe aren't exactly a threat to that. Trust me. Y yes, of course, Europe, the ultimate enemy of dinner. I mean, I've been to many pride parades in Europe as a drag queen, and never once have we attempted to stop an American eating dinner. So instead, <laughs> what exactly family values are is kept vague. It's just family. With, you know, a picture of like, I don't know, some white people smiling in a grass field or something. And, and then we throw in some words like uh, respect, uh, commitment, faith, that's a good one. Uh, maybe we'll put a horse in there for good measure. But the best part about this is because it's so vague and meaningless, it works in just about every country. Oh, God, in the world. yeah, it Starship means Trooper. When a fascist is pushed to define family values, they can give up whatever localized definition they want. That's step one with arguing with fascists, by the way. Never let them define anything. But the problem with the fascist ideology is it starts to break down when two fascists meet. And that's where the fun begins. Oh. Tucker Carlson represents the typical conservative in America. They see the world through the lens of the culture war. To them, rainbow flags on Bud Light cans and drag queen story time are the biggest threats to the American way of life and to Western civilization as a whole. Putin represents the Russian conservative, who thinks that Russia is the greatest country in the world, it was the first true civilization, it invented everything, and it saved the world from the Nazis all by itself. It also thinks that right, everyone yeah, in the that world whole hates Russia net. and doesn't understand why. So they are open to having that blank filled in by whoever happens to be talking the loudest and most importantly, can convince everyone that it's not Russia's fault why everyone hates them. These two sides of conservatism have <clears throat> never met before. They don't understand each other and they would start arguing if left in a room together. That both sides believe in one thing, that Western civilization is dying. We've passed the golden age, the pinnacle of society, this, this is the end. This Again, the, the arms crossed thing, I just... <laughs> oh god, I love that he did that, that's wonderful. This is the fall of Rome. And the thing is, both sides kind of disagree on what caused this, what's causing Rome to fall. Americans think it's because liberals are soft and weak and something something, good times make soft men. This works because it fits into their macho alpha male fantasy, where they are the tough men getting on with the work while the soft whiny liberals sit on their ass. They are from Sparta, everyone else is from Athens. Yeah, that's funny until you, you know, kind of remember that for the majority of history, I mean, Athens was the more, you know, powerful and important city-state compared to Sparta. Mm. <laughs> or Thebes. F***ing Thebes! And Russians think it's democracy. Democracy allowed charming liars who deceive everyone to get into power. Well, I mean... I guess if you want to go with that story, Putin is the, you know, the poster boy for that. Tring in an age of brain dead sheep people arguing over the nonsense while surrounding themselves with all the distracting pleasures of Western decadence. And that's the bridge. Because the Russians think the Nazis are responsible for that, and the American can be very easily convinced that liberals are the real Nazis. YouTube pundits have been trying to convince you that for years. Half of you probably shouted that out the second you knew where this was going. Come on, own up. Who said it? I'm not mad. And um, I mean, I'm going to be completely honest. I did not see that where that was going. I, I mean, I know like the general, like the the very left, not left, right leaning conservatives. But I mean, can, can, comparing the left to Nazis. I mean, that that just tells me that they don't know much about actual Nazi Germany. <laughs> okay. Okay, I I I just realized how much of a roller coaster ride this video is going to be and I am I'm mentally preparing myself for it. Oh god. In fairness, both Tucker and the Kremlin have been using the American culture war to further their own goals for over a decade, as has pretty much everyone else. I mean, if you give a politician the ability to avoid talking about controversial issues that require long and difficult and very expensive solutions by instead making token gestures and promises on things like safe spaces and microaggressions, then they're going to leap on that like Epstein at a high school prom. And everyone else is happy to go along with that because whining about gender roles is 
is far easier than actually doing anything useful. And that was the tune that was playing when Tucker agreed to this interview. He thought this was going to be his David Frost moment, that his career would be saved and that history would be made because he was the man who interviewed Putin in the middle of a controversial war, which was a hot button topic back in the States as millions of Americans asked why so much of their tax dollars were being shoveled into supporting Ukraine as hundreds of journalists had been turned away, he and he alone would get that interview. I know he claimed he was the only journalist who reached out for an interview. He wasn't. He was just the only one allowed to do it because he's probably the only journalist in the Western world that wouldn't immediately start grilling Putin on war crimes and missing children. All Tucker needed was a few good sound bites. He knew no one would watch the full interview. They just watched the highlights reel that would be broadcast to the nation over the coming weeks. All Putin needed to do was talk about how the liberals had opened the door to the Nazis. Tucker would link it to wokeism. Putin would laugh and then agree. And as a reward, Tucker would get to grill Putin on a few light issues that he would give pushback on, and then it kind of agreed to resolve. Interview over, everyone goes home and has a wank. But the problem is, that didn't happen. Oh, what actually God. happened was Tucker sat there dumbfounded for over half an hour as Putin droned on and on about the time Peter the Great and Stalin joined forces to defeat the evil Ice Queen and retake Castle Grayskull to defeat the Orcs of the Third Age, and that's why Ukraine didn't exist. Tucker attempted several times to get Putin back on topic to get that soundbite out of him, but Putin ignored him and instead kept talking about that one time the Russian Tsars all banded together to form the Megazord to defeat <laughs> the evil Lizard Queen hidden in Earth's secret second moon. <laughs> Saving oh God, the from no. invasion and inventing the potato at the same time. And this is more telling than anything. More than anything he actually said, which has been debunked about a hundred times by now, it's this rambling, this meaningless rant, and the fact that this was allowed to happen that is the telltale sign of what is really going on within the walls of the Kremlin. Allow me to explain. Well, I mean, just with that, I mean, like, it's the whole thing where it's obviously... It's obvious, well, I mean, Putin is getting older. I'm not going to say, like, you know, he has, like, dementia or something like that, because obviously he doesn't, but he is getting older, and people's minds... It's a rare breed of person who can keep 100% of their faculties as they get older. I mean, my grandfather, on my mother's side, he is 99 years old. And, and granted, like, he is still, you know really well with it but there but there's always the, you know little things every day you know the the whole thing where like you'll walk into a room forget why he's there and it scares him it's those little things i would imagine you know something similar happening with putin except he's also literally the most powerful man in the in his, in the country um and unlike say with somebody like biden who also looks you know it have some you know age related stuff going on upstairs um, everybody is too scared to talk about what's going on with Putin because they're afraid that he will rightly get insulted and make them disappear. <laughs> at least that's my working theory at the moment. Prior to this war, many in the military hobbyist sphere regarded Putin as a bit of a bald badass. This somewhat undesired reputation of Putin is an illusion, a creation of propaganda of course, of that course. has been carefully curated by those around him and by his advisor, Vladislav Surkov, a man who came from theatre and who used the act of performance to turn Russian politics into a pantomime of heroic displays and patriotism, a race of beings capable of the extreme feats of human endurance, the most badass, but most importantly, the most chill. People who wouldn't complain and whine, but just get on with things regardless of any extreme. In the world of soft soy boys, they were the nation of true hard men. And at the head of it all, the perfect Russian leader, the supreme image of masculinity, which radiated this idea of Russian power and Russian exceptionalism. I remember being at a war games club many years ago, long before COVID, and a friend of mine was talking politics, comparing Britain's own weak looking then leader, David Cameron, to that of Putin, pulling up a video in which a Russian factory on the verge of shutting down was in its final meeting with its shareholders in walks Putin and demands the factory be kept open. No one argues with them. They even all sign an agreement that the factory will remain open, saving the jobs of all who work there. And to cap it off, someone tries to steal his pen, and he demands it back. Okay, well... I'm going to be completely honest. I mean, if somebody doesn't see... If, if somebody sees that and doesn't immediately think that whole thing was staged, um... Yeah, there, there, lights are on, nobody's home. 
It took a lot not to tell my friend that this was a complete work of propaganda. It was completely set up. The whole thing, right down to the pen stealing, was a stunt designed to make everyone else see this strong leader called Putin. Stunts like this were enough to impress my friend and was likely aimed at specifically people like him. People who were tired of incompetent, weak-spined governments and thus were more open to loud political stunts full of bravado and one-upmanship that dictators churn out like crappy TikToks, which people are encouraged to refer to as refreshing. Along with Putin's mm. potentially confusing political stances on various subjects, for example donating and supporting to pro-LGBT charities and activism groups, while also banning images of the rainbow flag and comparing gay men to pedophiles, supporting pro-liberal groups while encouraging and rewarding groups of neo-fascist skinheads for attacking them, and supporting democracy while crowning himself president for life and arresting and eventually killing his own political opponents. I had, uh, okay, I had no idea he did that. Uh, wow, okay. Etc, etc. Putin would play out this bizarre hypocrisy which kept the Russian people in a state of semi-confusion. But because people have a tendency to cherry pick and because news is always targeted towards a certain demographic, it meant that most people, regardless of political affiliation, always saw Putin as an ally even if a secret one. This meant that political arguments always happened around Putin, directed at those on the other side of the political line, and not at Putin himself. So if things went wrong, Putin was never to blame. There was always a fall guy. And this all worked because Putin was never directly in charge of anything. Surrounding Putin were his advisors. Sure, Putin was the front man, he was the one in the newspaper, with the fancy suits, the car, he and the is image. The president. Perhaps he fully did believe that he was in charge. But surrounding him, his closest friends, his advisors, would take his orders for the day and translate them to the Duma, the Russian parliament. If you understand the nuance behind the word translate in that context. Ah, so this meant okay. that Putin could continue living in the mental state he needed to be in to present the image he needed to be to the Russian public, and to a lesser extent the Western public. And he was undoubtedly rewarded for doing so. But it also meant that he was deluded into believing he truly was the person the propaganda claimed him to be. And as this war has gone on, his advisors have dropped off one by one. His interference and micromanaging of this war has increased until we arrive at the point where he has taken full command. And and the illusion has finally been shattered. Oh, so that's where they're going with this. He's not, he's not senile. He's, he's huffing his own, he's in his own sauce. Oh God. Okay, so yeah. So the great and powerful leader who believes his own hype. Of course. Oh. For most people, this was the first time they had ever heard Putin speak without a script. This was the first time they had ever heard what he actually believes. There was no show because there was no one left to put it on. Zarkov resigned in 2020 and is currently under house arrest, Gherkin is in oh, prison, really? and as the rest of Putin's advisors have dropped off the map, the ones who have remained have sensed the change in the air. As the various oligarchs mysteriously fall out of windows, as arrests for crimes for questioning the rule of the great leader continue to rise, and even recently, as Putin's long-term political opponent Avele died in prison, it has become pretty obvious that being opposed to Putin right now is a pretty bad idea. And the people for surround Putin at the top right now are veterans of surviving political purges. <laughs> they are smart enough to know exactly what to say to keep the great leader happy. This means when Putin's generals say they have destroyed 500 American Abrams tanks, Putin believes it. He genuinely believes he is in a mano a mano struggle with the entirety of NATO and he is winning. So excuses for Russia's slow progress can be made because all of NATO is fighting him while he stands alone. This is not a product of stupidity. Putin is not an idiot. This is just what happens when you exclusively surround yourself with, with people yes, who man. only ever agree with you. It happens to everyone. It'll probably happen to you. You know, I... I <laughs> This whole thing, yeah, I, I really, you know, I hope that this whole thing comes crashing down sooner rather than later. Just be purely because, you know, the level of yes man around Putin is just, mm. oh god, can you imagine if like it gets to the point where he's like, oh god, what was that? Yeah, what was what was that movie? That took place inside Hitler's bunker at, near the end of World War Two. 
Um, and he's like commanding units that don't actually exist anymore. When can, can we fast forward to that part of the rush? Like where like Putin's uh, where like Putin's commanding uh, like units of the army to do stuff that haven't existed for like several years. <laughs> that would be fun, wouldn't it? But you're not in charge of sending half a million people to their deaths, so thankfully, I don't know. We're entering a strange new world now, with new life and new civilizations to boldly go where no man has gone before. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> but what this interview tells us is that there is basically no one at the helm of the Kremlin's macho Putin PR machine. And what you are seeing is basically Putin without the mask, without all the clever editing, the scripts, the body doubles, and the team of spin doctors that surround him. And Putin has basically gone feral. He's gone against Tucker. He's even gone against Trump. He is not dancing to the same tune as everybody else now, and he actively refuses to do so. So everyone else else is left trying to figure out how this strange new dance goes and sing along to the words that they can't quite hear. <laughs> Essentially, the future is now uncertain. Putin has gone off script and no one is quite sure what he's going to do next. When people talk about the great Russian bear, this is what they mean. Bears are unpredictable by their nature. Bears can never be fully domesticated or tamed. Bears do what they want. The American right, the conservatives, believed that they could domesticate Putin and use him as a tool of their culture war. The Kremlin, and to a point the right-wing movement in America and Britain, have been paving the groundwork for that for years. And American conservatives worship Putin as this pseudo-alpha male defender of Christian and family values, even though he's not Christian and his wife divorced him. They believed that they could... I mean, that is sort of... Okay, so I, I gotta point that out. I mean, like... That is like a really com that is like a really common trait for these like like these right leaning leaders like they, they they spout so much about like family values and all this sort of stuff and yet they they're either like you know divorced or they've like had multiple affairs I mean I'm, I'm, and I'm literally talking about the two men in this picture right now I swear it's like it, I, I know, like, I know you're gonna get, like, people who are hypocrites, like, no matter what end of the spectrum you're on, but I mean, like, why, like, it seems like more of them are on one side than the other, at the very least. Use him as a tool to further their own goals, but Putin is not playing along, and everyone who was in on it is now slowly realizing that Putin does not dance to your tune, you, you dance, dance to, to his. his, and he will use you to further his own goals, and if he can't... Putin carefully handed yep. the reactionaries and contrarians into doing his bidding because, like everyone else, they always saw him as a secret ally. But Putin never cared about them or whatever struggle they envisioned themselves fighting. He only inserted himself into the American culture war to slowly erode popular support for Ukraine. But beyond that, he didn't care about anything else. They were merely a tool to support his own ambitions, and they were promptly discarded once they ran their usefulness. But as long as his goons were shouting lib tarred at Ukraine supporters, everyone on the right was eager to go along with it because, well, it fit their narrative and, yeah, there was a sense of superiority there, wasn't there? And everyone on the left was doing the same, except this time the goons were chanting, America bad, something something Iraq war. But hey, you're a smart boy and you're immune to propaganda, ain't ya? But now the right, illusion yeah. that this war was all somehow tied to the American deep state has been shattered. The Vatniks are now faced with the reality that Putin was not an ally, he was just using them. And they have been left with two choices. Pretend that it all didn't happen and carry on as normal, or realize that they have been gaslit into actively participating in an information war in which the end goal was the genocide of the Ukrainian people and the theft of their lands. Which you know, I, you know, something tells me that they're going to pick the former option rather than the lighter. Granted, again, I've been kind of, you know, I, I make sure, I try my best to keep out of those circles just for my own sanity. So um, I'm kind of out of the loop, as it were. Which they were more than happy to go along with because they were being manipulated by a foreign government and encouraged to call it 
patriotism. Their entire shtick was a simplified reduction of an overcomplicated 30-year-old ongoing political situation boiled down to its most simplistic form and delivered to them through the medium of quote tweets, memes and grifters posing as experts. Their knowledge has been passed through so many simplification filters it barely resembles anything close to factual accuracy, and all it has achieved is to mask the reality that hundreds of thousands of people are dying while they sit in their comfortable homes, playing at politics, patting themselves on the back while they watch entire cities get vaporised because, hey, that sure showed them libs. There is no reward at the end of this for all of them. The dominoes are not going to fall in their favour, and when the Ukrainian war ends, regardless of the outcome, they will simply be herded on to the next big thing by whoever wants to use them to further their own political goals. And maybe some of them will be smart enough to get off the train, but if there's one common thing I have noticed among the Vatniks, its intelligence is not exactly their forte. And for yeah. every one Vatnik, for every grifter that steps down, there are 10,000 who would kill to be in in their position. That just leaves one final question, and it's the biggest question on everyone's lips. It was at the start of this war, and it still is somewhat today. It's the question Putin spent over half an hour trying to explain while utterly failing to answer. <coughs> which is why. Why invade Ukraine? In 2014, Putin had basically seized a region the size of Belgium, cementing his dominance over the Black Sea. With an active territorial dispute, Ukraine would not have been allowed to join either NATO or the EU without giving up any territorial claim over Crimea and eastern Ukraine. Ukraine was still economically dependent on Russia for gas and oil, and it still feared the Russian army, which was still seen as one of the largest, one of the most powerful, and one of the most respected in the world. Yeah, it was. Best of all, no one cared about Ukraine. People protest angrily at NATO and America for being viewed as an imperialist colonizing world power, but when actual imperialistic colonization from a major world superpower happened directly in front of them, no one gave a shit. In 2014, Russia waltzed into a sovereign nation, a developed nation in Europe, and simply annexed part of it. And all people could do was giggle at how much of a badass Putin was, and how funny the whole situation seemed to be. In fact, America was still trying to deepen its ties with Russia, Europe was happy to become solely dependent on Russia for cheap oil and gas, and were even starting to see Putin as a bit of a friend. So much so that when both Obama and Trump tried to make Europe take Russia more seriously as a threat, they were both laughed out of the room. European nations were gradually reducing their military spending, and even though there was some attempt to assist Ukraine in redeveloping its armed forces after 2014, this was token at best. Ukraine actually got frustrated numerous times with just how lackluster NATO's response was to its needs. No one in Europe believed Ukraine was in any danger, and if Russia did invade, well, it would all be over in a matter of days, far faster than anyone could possibly be expected to react, and well, no one was really going to shed any tears over it anyway, so what was the point? And besides, Ukraine wasn't even unified as a country. It saw itself more as three individual regions with its own customs and cultures, not a united nation and Putin's invasion changed all of that as one you know I just I listened to all of that and it really does kind of make you a little bit depressed I mean yeah there was the whole the whole thing of you know it's the whole thing of like you know pretending that it's that's okay, because I mean the whole thing with like, I, what is it called, like real politique or something? I mean, when it comes down to it, every country is basically just down for the, is just down for themselves basically. So the fact that you could have like these leaders, I mean, like basically fall for it. I mean, what what do you expect? They it was the easy way. Everyone wants to take the easy way. One Ukrainian soldier put it: "We weren't a nation before." But now we are. And though Ukraine would still refer to NATO's response as lackluster, its efforts have been monumental in comparison to what it was doing previously. Modern jets, modern tanks, and equipment have finally been made available to them. And while the Vatniks will jeer and gloat every time Ukraine loses one, no one can deny they have been highly effective. 
And though the EU has not exactly been lightning fast to respond, like a fat man who's fallen asleep at the party, it's woken to realise the buffet is now open and is lurching towards it at speed. Europe oh God, is rearming, what's that video Finland from? and Sweden have joined NATO, money for future weapons projects has suddenly been found, and development into alternate gas and oil infrastructure has been a major focus. Putin's oligarchs have lost almost the entirety of their holdings in Europe, half his war chest has been seized by the banks, and regardless of the outcome of this war, his entire army will need to be rebuilt from scratch. Yeah, and basically, worst of all, yeah. His reputation is in absolute tatters. The Russian army is no longer seen as the ferocious, dominating entity it once was. In fact, people now question why we even feared it in the first place. Russia's weapons export potential, which was a huge part of their development funding, is now basically null, and all the oil and gas it was selling to Europe is now being sold to China at an even larger discount. And though the Russian economy hasn't completely collapsed, the cracks are indeed showing. In one move, Putin gambled and lost basically everything. So what was he hoping to gain? Why gamble it all in Ukraine? What's so important about this one small Eastern European nation that Putin was willing to take that risk? Well, I mean, obviously you can't get into the, the man's head. I don't think I'd even want to. But... I mean, it, it, Ukraine, for, you know, everything that lacked, had a lot of potential. I mean, one, you know, it, it was and arguably still is the breadbasket of Europe. Well, I mean, it's probably going to take a, a, even after the war a little while for that to come back to, uh, back to normal. Two, like, they discovered, like, just a couple of years, and this was, and they talked about this, like, in another Laserpig video. Where, like, they had just discovered, like, massive deposits of oil and gas in eastern Ukraine. You know, the, the areas that Russia is currently controlling. And that could have potentially put Ukraine in standing to supply Europe with gas and oil as opposed to Russia. So there was that too. And then there's the whole thing of the belief that Ukrainian culture doesn't actually exist. And that they're just confused Russians. So... Yeah, and then there was the thing with the Navy and the ports in Crimea, which then they took Crimea, but they... It's, when you actually think about it, there was a, there was a lot of reasons why he, why he did it. Though I have a feeling, knowing, uh, knowing Laser Pig, that he's going to go into something really weird that I didn't even think of. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what the madness is. The thing is, no one really knows. A lot of people have theories, oh, never mind. And, well, the real reason is probably incredibly complicated and known only to Putin himself. And like I said, this is a 30 year long period of history between two of the most corrupt countries in Europe, masterminded by a man whose gradual decline into insanity would have been comedic gold had it not been for all the blood and death. It's also a situation that has been completely ignored by the West, and bringing everyone up to speed on the spaghetti of information would take longer than I probably have left to live given my diet of wine anger and unrefrigerated sticks of butter. Thankfully, I don't have to. A channel I reference a lot but I've never gotten around to giving a shout out, Sarcasmatron, did a four part video series on the whole situation dating right back to the start of things. Okay, wait, he, he referred to that in another video. I'm, I'm definitely gonna have to save that. Sarcasma. Okay, here we go. This is the, yeah, this is the video. Yeah, so I'm definitely gonna have to watch this later. Whether I do a reaction or not to it or not, you know, uh, you you guys tell me if you'd like, you know, any reactions to this stuff. Several hours long and comes the closest to bringing any sort of answer to the question of why that I've seen from anyone else, so I would strongly recommend you watch his videos, and I'll leave links to them in the description. Crap, I just realized he did the same joke in his video about no bullshit. Uh, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> okay, forget that, that never happened, okay? Shut up! You can't prove anything! But part four of his video series touches on a personal theory of mine. I had been working on my own video about it, so I'm somewhat annoyed that I wasn't the first to get to point it all out, but that's my own fault. <laughs> now I'd rather you go watch his video about it, so I'll be brief and cover the basics. And the basics are... Putin believes in color revolution theory. Color revolution theory? What? Now you may be asking yourself... Dear Laserpick, you handsome bastard, what the living f*** is color revolution theory? 
Well, dear child, allow me to explain what color revolution theory is. Color revolution theory is the idea that a shadow organization that, you know, operates behind the scenes, unseen by anyone. Pick your favorite. It's often the CIA, though it does flip between, you know, the American deep state, the Illuminati, the British royal family, and of course, the Jews, are responsible course, for every course. major revolution since the end of the Second World War. Yes, all of them. It is believed that through things like left-leaning news sources, social media influence, and performance art displays, the idea of rebellion is implanted gradually in the youth of a generation, and as this generation gets older, its frustrations with the establishment are amplified. It is encouraged to rebel against the older traditions and generations, and the tools of protest are made available to it through the use of paid actors who take the mantle of protest leaders, riling up the population into a bulging riot of banners and cardboard signs. This eventually forms a powder keg situation in which the slightest trigger will set the whole thing off. And when it does go off, which our chosen shadow government puppet agency will absolutely make sure that it does, the country openly rebels. This time not with cardboard signs, this time with guns and explosions and bombs and another big explosion bloody gunny machine things that we all get excited about in this community. With the shadowy background figure group funding pro-revolutionary forces and flooding their ranks with paid mercenaries. Now, does any of that make sense? Because to the layman, that all sounds plausible. It sounds like something which is probably happening. In fact, you could probably name a country or two where this kind of thing has absolutely definitely happened. Because not only is a version of this conspiracy theory used to hand wave away how socialism has never worked because er, der, America always interferes, it also forms the basis of another conspiracy theory, cultural Marxism. Culture That's right, now, the I hard think left and the I think I may have heard that one before. I can't remember what it is. The hard right believe in the same conspiracy theory just under a different name, and they haven't realized it yet. But the reality is, the whole thing is utter nonsense. Every government in the world has at one point attempted a sort of experiment into this exact sort of thing. Every government, every major corporation, and even a lot of random individuals have invested heavily into research on mass manipulation. You may know of one called MKUltra, which is probably yes. the most famous of these attempts. Uh, though what MKUltra actually is, is often widely obscured by generations of conspiracy loons. It was research into a truth serum, that's it. It was That was all it was. It was just a truth serum. It never worked. The CIA buried it because they were embarrassed about the time and money they spent trying to chase a dream. That's it. There, there's no greater conspiracy. They're just embarrassed by it. But to the person who supposedly cracks it, unlimited wealth is at their disposal. Every government in the world would pay everything they have to make their populations just agree with everything they do without having to bother about the democracy bit of their democratic government. Dictators hmm. could live without ever having to face challenge to their rule, and corporations could exist free of competition. It's all very well cyberpunk. But the very, thing, yeah, actually, yeah. the most important thing, which has been revealed time and time again anytime someone gets this idea, is that in all the attempts made, every single one of them, it simply proved that such a thing just doesn't work. But explaining why such a thing is oh god, I don't know what footage to put here, so here is more footage of that sumo wrestler running. Oh, so that's a sumo wrestler, okay. Serious complete bollocks, and why it doesn't work in spite of numerous and increasingly sophisticated attempts is in itself a complicated matter. Effectively, color revolution theory, and to the same extent cultural Marxism, though I still do plan to cover that specifically in a different video, probably at the end of this year when I'm too drunk on Christmas wine to read the comments, is something that is is easier to believe is happening because it has the illusion of truth to it than be explained to why it most definitely isn't. But as has now been well documented, then I am completely insane. I will give it a try. I promise to try and not be boring about it, but there is a lot to explain here. So here goes. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is like, I I was I almost wasn't paying attention to what Laser Beak just said just because the, the footage didn't match at all. I'm sorry. And I mean, I I I I know I'm an overweight man myself, but I, that's why I generally don't run around without my shirt on. 
Okay, so before we begin, I have to explain something. You see, there is a secret side quest in life reserved entirely for people studying literally anything on the Soviet Union. History is a bit weird like that. Investigating the history of literally anything will inevitably lead you down rabbit holes, but investigating the history of the Soviet Union is not a rabbit hole, it's a Skyrim-esque adventure. Oh the god. Oh, the no. Soviet Union has inspired so many great comedies because it is literally that ridiculous. The plot of Dune explained by three separate drunk individuals who have never actually read the book but do vaguely remember seeing the old 1984 film. Oh. The guild does not take your order would be easier oh. to understand than the history of anything the Soviet Union has attempted to actually do. It is a pantomime of bureaucracy, a triumph of incompetence, masterminded by a ruling class whose mind processes run parallel to Reddit mods. That is not a compliment, by the way. The Soviet Union was not a country, it was a parody of one. Everything it ever tried to do was entangled by each and every individual along its overly complicated bureaucratic processes, each introducing their own special brand of corruption, incompetence, political agenda, self-interest, and of course whatever money and political favours they could grub from it. This is <laughs> an environment that breeds a very special type of person, a person who exists in a world where everyone has to constantly prove their superiority, their dominance. Everyone is out for themselves, everyone has an agenda, and trusting anyone is a short path to the gulag. Secrets must be protected at all costs, your true identity must be be buried in layers of masks that you wear for each and every person. Everything is a deception. Everyone is trying to use you for something. Competence is suspicious and paranoia is rewarded. And every day, every single second of every minute of every hour, you must be prepared to defend your position in the entire chain against anyone who He's would rather be have your position really? and all the trappings that come with it. This is life in the Kremlin. This is the crucible that birth the minds of the people who currently sit in power in Moscow. These people do not see the world like we do. They see it as a reflection of the world they know within the Kremlin and treat it in the same manner. They view the world in conspiracies, plans within plans within plans. No one can be trusted. Everything is a deception. Every word said a lie, trying to disguise a greater meaning, and every action the result of a well-planned and coordinated attack. There are no coincidences in this world. Nothing just happens. Everything, regardless of how minor, is the footprints of a plan of some nemesis hiding in the shadows waiting to strike. And to these people, there is no leaving this life. That paranoid world brings a feeling of comfort that is such a fundamental security to them that the idea that anyone around them could be open and honest is instantly dismissed as a trick. That that is the mental state of a conspiracy theorist, one so far gone that the idea that there is no conspiracy is such a terrifying thought that anyone who proclaims as such must be one of them out to get you. So if you can imagine a room full of Mike Sparks clones attempting to run a country, you might be a step closer to understanding why Russia is the way it is and why it do the things it do. God, I think I finally get it. Just, just thinking about that, that sounds absolutely terrifying. Like, having to be mentally on edge every second of your life just because, I mean, it's not like the world's going to be any better than I am, so I can't put my defenses down. I remember, I remember thinking... Uh, when Laserpig was talking about the, the T-14 Armada and it, when he was talking about the, the, the things he knew about general Russian culture from when he, you know, he had a, a Russian boyfriend who was a tanker and talking about, like, the whole thing where, like, corruption was just a normal part of Russian life like, I, I, f I remember feeling, like, really sad and confused about that, but like listening to that, basically imagining an entire government bureaucracy run by nothing but conspiracy theorists, all like just like running like around pantomime, like just doing what they've learned from a from a from a 
from like a previous administration that was, you know, maybe even worse. That is that is absolutely terrifying. I I I, I can't say anything more than that. That's just wow. Keep that in mind, because it will be important. But first, we should address the United Fruit Company in the room, because most of you by now will be furiously screaming in the comments, that's all good and well for you to say in a government... No, sorry, that's the wrong voice. I should be doing the whiny liberal voice. Hang on, two seconds. It's all good and well for you to say governments around the world aren't trying to manipulate revolutions, Mr. Pig. But we have an entire wiki page full of the times the US has interfered in the ruling of another country and imposed things like regime change. In fact, anti-US sentiments across Latin America are fueled by a series of regime changes that pushed into power dictators that were backed by the United States government. The fact the US did this is famous. Movies have been made about this. It's page one of any thesis any modern philosophy student writes. It's spanned by literally hundreds of Russia butt accounts every day. How could you not know this, Mr. Pig? Are you stupid? Wow, that's a strain on the throat. Here's the thing. Yes, the CIA has implemented regime change when it suited them across multiple countries. And though the CIA will happily take the credit for these, the thing most people don't seem to be aware of is the CIA lies. Quite a lot. In fact, in many places where the CIA has intervened, not only has their involvement been blown up past the point of the extreme, it regularly failed to work. In fact, more than of half the time, course. it completely exploded in the CIA's face. There's a reason they don't do it anymore. Guatemala <laughs> is probably the most famous examples of a US-led coup against a democratically-led authority. The history of it will probably make you hate the US, the CIA, and the Chiquita Banana Lady. I'm Chiquita Banana, and I'm here to say I am the top banana in the world today. Ba 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 ba. Look, we were all thinking it, okay? <laughs> in short, this was a CIA-backed coup against a democratically elected leader of a country who had been slowly introducing socialist policies such as minimum wage and welfare. The US saw this as communism. But even worse, this drove up expectations for both wages and working conditions for those under the employ of the United Fruit Company, who insisted that the US intervene so it could keep its workers basically living under slave conditions and thus not affecting their bottom line. Because of, of this course. one thing America Americans hate more than anything, it's paying slightly more for fruit. Digging into the two scoops in every Kellogg's pack. Two scoops will keep them coming back. So the CIA intervened, and a few short months later, Jaco Barbanez was overthrown, and military dictator Carlos Castillo Maz was installed instead, who immediately reversed all those nasty socialist policies. I'm probably butchering those names, so I apologize. But the thing is, this wasn't a revolution, and the CIA failed. Twice. Once in 1952, where an operation to use fruit-carrying freighters to smuggle guns into the country was almost immediately discovered by the U.S. Customs Office, <laughs> and thus the CIA was forced to abandon the plan. And then again in <laughs> Oh my god. I, I love it. Of course, of course, another branch of the U.S. to stop that. Of course. 1954, where even with hundreds of pro-revolutionary fighters funded with U.S. money, with U.S. guns and planes, they lost every single battle they fought in. The population refused to rise up in arms, and the CIA were considering pulling the plug when the Guatemalan military suddenly laid down its arms, and Arbanez stood down. And what had done it was not a populist revolution, it was the fear the country would be invaded by the U.S. if Guatemala won. The CIA proudly slapped themselves on the back, installed their puppet dictator who immediately seized full control for himself, resulting in a 40-year-long civil war and the genocide of the Mayan people. Go America! And yet, the CIA decided this coup was so successful it would form the template for all future attempts, such as in Albania, where it didn't work, or in Cambodia, where it didn't work, or in Cuba, where it didn't work, or in the Dominican Republic, where it did work, and then the US puppet government they installed was almost immediately overthrown. So you're telling me this, this all of that could have been potentially just not happened if if that one country hadn't, well, if that one leader hadn't stepped down. Oh, wow, okay. I mean, that's a, that's a lot to take in, I'm sorry. Or in the Congo, where it failed so badly, it threatened to become a proxy war with the USSR, and Belgium had to come and bail the US out. The thing is, I'm not Belgium. trying to make light of any of these incidents. America has done some 
eat up shit during its short reign as a world superpower, and it should feel some measure of shame in that. But the reality is, that does not make it unique among any other country in the world. The British Empire invented the concept of the concentration camp. The French didn't invent slavery, but they did make it a cornerstone of financial stability in their empire. Spain left a trail of massacres, tortures, and rapes in the wake of their empire, and the Soviet Union is responsible for over 30 massacres in its history, resulting in the deaths of tens of millions of people, as well as spending a considerable sum of money trading and supplying international terrorist organizations willing to target Western nations out of a base in Dresden, East Germany, coincidentally where Putin was based during his time in the KGB, which included oh, the IRA, the Red Army Faction, and anything anti-Israel, including something they have allegedly continued to do to this day. But I'm sure Hamas launching a major attack on Israel at precisely the exact time Russia needed something to distract the US away from Ukraine was just a coincidence. Oh, and if you think what the yeah. US was doing in South America was bad, the USSR was doing the exact same shit. You just don't know about it because that side of history is quite rarely taught. And the thing is, mm -hmm. it's not wrong to discuss America's crimes. In fact, many would argue that's the foundation of a stable and good society, where we can be critical of ourselves and our actions and demand that we as a nation, or even as a civilization, be held to a higher standard. You live in a country where you can criticize your country's actions without consequences. They are known and taught openly, and that does work to keep ourselves in check. When people want to read up on American or British war crimes, they have to open a history book. If you want to know Russian war crimes, you pick up a newspaper. In short, anything bad we do, even on a small scale like a, a drone hitting the wrong target or a cop shooting a dog, become national scandals and hot political talking points. In Russia, that's just Tuesday. It does have its downsides, however. Through a combination of Russian and Soviet propaganda, conspiracy theorists, misinformation, and that good old Noam Chomsky America bad culture that runs yeah. through many student unions, the story of these events has been overemphasized to the point of the extreme. And while it's good these events are being highlighted so that people are aware of them, their use purely as propaganda tools rather than as discussions of our own behavior as a country and how we should tackle things like foreign policy in the future as a reflection of that has meant that a certain element of these stories, the involvement of the CIA, has taken front and centre stage. Perhaps inadvertently, the CIA has been elevated to the position of that of a god, capable of Illuminati-style operations where men in tight suits and black sunglasses are capable of controlling the world. Ooh. Oh, Whereas god, in reality, yeah. the CIA is no more competent or capable than any other intelligence agency. But for years, the crimes of America has been taught to the Russian population, and in doing so, the godhood of the CIA has actually become part of Russian culture. It's an in-joke in Russian society to blame the CIA on anything bad that happens. Fruit prices rise, it was the CIA. Trip over a rock, CIA. Your grandmother finds your porn stash and smacks you over the head, probably the CIA that told her. Even Putin believes it. But unlike the Russian public who see it as a meme, he takes it seriously. And he has directly accused the CIA of doing everything from inciting soldiers to kill journalists to creating the internet. He has even accused both Obama what? and Hillary Clinton of using the CIA to incite a color revolution within the borders of Russia. When conspiracy theorists claim things like the Arab Spring was all a CIA cover-up, Putin believes them, because he lives in the magical Kremlin wonderland. So any evidence that this is not a case, or anyone telling him he is wrong, is obviously an agent of the conspiracy trying to fool him, and thus not to be trusted. And the thing is, what he's failed to realize is in all the examples I gave above, those were not color revolutions. The CIA did not incite revolutions encouraging populations to rebel against their government. They tried, but they couldn't do it. You know what was easier? Simply finding some idiot who desired power and could be convinced to see things from the US point of view if they got enough things from the Sky Mall, and then simply fed them enough guns and drugs until they were in power, which inevitably backfired because power-hungry idiots do not tend to be great leaders. You know, I mean... If this video has done one thing, and it's done one thing very well so far, and it's make me even more terrified of Putin than I already was, because the only thing more scary than a genius uh, with ultimate power is an idiot with ultimate power. <laughs> 
In each of these situations, when a populist rebellion did happen, it either went against US interests, such as the Dominican Republic, or was already in progress long before the CIA got involved, such as in Brazil. In times where it has been suspected of involvement, such as in Euromaidan with the famous Mullen Prutt phone call, the reality of the situation has been obscured by the sheer amount of misinformation which surrounds the event. Sarcasmatron covered it pretty well. Now, none of this should be surprising. When people talk about cultural Marxism, what they fear is that socialist and communist ideologies are being taught to the young in order to prepare them for a pro-communist uprising. The people they always blame for this are not world governments with anti-US mentalities or actual communists, it's the Frankfurt School of Thought. This is because their arguments come from canned arguments found online, which can be traced back to neo-Nazis who have found the Jew to blame, and thus no further thought or investigation is required. In the uh, same okay. manner, the minds of the Kremlin have found where the CIA is to blame, and thus no further thought is required. they found the conclusion they want. The Euromaidan phone call is not just an intercepted communication from Ukraine looking for advice that never really went anywhere, it's the cornerstone of all the evidence Putin needs to prove that the whole thing was a CIA plot. It doesn't matter what else happened or is said, or even if no actual evidence of CIA involvement has ever been found, all of that can be dismissed because we have that phone call. And that is it for now. If you want to see the second part of this reaction, links to it are in the description in the top corner of the video, as well as it should be, you know, appearing over my face any second now. I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.